Okay, uh, questions? Very interesting. Um, I see that you're uh, differentiating between the semantic representation of common sense and the actual photo and the pixels. Uh, doesn't that mean that you can actually extend this framework to audio as well? Applying the same framework to recognize voices and have a dialogue about what, it, what you're hearing and what it means? Right, so I think, I think there could be two components there. One is trying to use audio signals to learn knowledge about the world. So just like you can try and learn it from text, which is already somewhat more semantic than pixels are. Um, and if you could convert your speech signals to text, maybe people talk about things in speech that they don't necessarily write about in text or that you don't see in the visual world. And so there might be complementary information there that you could leverage. Um, and, and in terms of interacting with an agent, in terms of visual dialogue, speech is certainly a much more sort of high bandwidth way of doing it than, than typing, right? So even on a keyboard, we can type some tens of words per minute. On a, on a phone, if you're trying to text, it's usually just about 10 words a minute if you're good at it, whereas speech, it's hundreds of words per minute. So that's, that's a much higher bandwidth mode of interaction. That's yes, sure. my, my, my point was basically audio, not just the speech part of it. So when you're listening into a jungle, what animals I are see. there and what's happening in there? I see, I see, uh, that, 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 yeah, I think, right, I think that would be interesting. There is some, there is some the work on, use, on using audio, not just speech. Um, it's more from the perspective of trying to use it as um, a cheap su supervisory signal to build visual models. So if I can take a video that has an associated soundtrack, and if I find all the frames that have similar sounds associated with it, there you go. then I already know that my frames probably have similar semantics because they have similar sound associated with it. And I can use that as a signal to start training my deep models instead of having to sit down and, every, and annotate every single image. So there's definitely work in that space, yeah. Okay, next question. Sir Surf again. Just coming back to speech recognition, one of the big challenges that, uh, that we experienced with our um, Google Assistant is that there are multiple people in, in the home, for example, and we have to distinguish voices, especially if you want to make sure that it's not the six-year-old that's disabling the security system or doing something else. Okay. That's turned out to be fairly hard uh, right. for us to do. Um, I, and we don't have any visual clue at the moment that's pure uh, voice input. Uh, in the course of your work, are you looking at multimedia um, individual rec speaker recognition so that you have more than just sound as input? Right, so I haven't looked at that um, myself. And I think this, it makes a lot of sense. If you had visual cues, it would be easier to tell. But then there's privacy concerns with having cameras watching homes and people around it. <coughs> Um, and this issue of picking up on any sound in the home, I don't know if all of you saw that, but there was this recent thing with Alexa um, where there was a, on, on the news, someone was talking about a situation where a child ended up ordering something on Alexa. And so the reporter ended up saying that Alexa, buy me blah, I forget what blah was, it was some toy. And so all over the, that region, Alexa in people's homes picked that up of what the news reporter was saying. and. Mm -hmm placed orders or almost placed orders, or I don't, I don't know the, the extent to which that happens. So that's very much an issue. If you could tell that this is not a family member speaking, and in fact, it's a voice coming from the TV, it's not even a human, a real human in the room, um, I think that would be useful. But we haven't looked at that in my lab, yeah. Thank you very much. I thought that was fascinating. Um, I thought your use of the term common sense <laughs> is really interesting because it strikes me what you're actually talking about is the kind of in hu human interpretation and insight process based around things which aren't directly observable in those images. And, and I guess what struck me is actually, when you think about how people process information, there's very little common across people in that insight process because we all rely on our own experiences, on our own perceptions. And I just wanted to go back to some of the conversations earlier about what machine learning is good for versus what it isn't. Is, is that one of the fundamental challenges in this area about how do we encode for that sort of top-down processing and insight? Right, so I think, um, I think there's a few different things there. So one, like I was saying, I think the definition of common sense is, and there are others in the room who are more, who sort of have looked at this for many years longer than I have. Um, but in, when I say common sense, I'm just referring to it as exactly what you said, that information that's not in the pixels of the image, but is coming from our experience of the world, um, whether it's sort of, yeah, I won't get into that more, but yeah, anything that's not in the pixels and is external is what I'm thinking of as common sense. Um, about the point where 
there's not much common amongst us. I'm not, uh, maybe we can talk about this more offline, but I'm not so sure if that's true because if it were completely different sort of social interactions and going back to autonomous driving, right? When we all get to an intersection, there's so much in common, if nothing else, and even based on this in the geographic location, like how we drive in India versus how we drive in the US is completely different. And the cues that we pick up on are very different. And so I think all of that is the common sense that is common amongst us, right? That so if I'm a pedestrian crossing the road in front of a car, I make sure I make eye contact. And if there is eye contact, I'm reasonably sure the other person has seen me, and then I'll proceed. And I think those are tactics that are fairly common amongst a lot of people. Um, so I think I agree there are some differences, but I do think there is a lot, in, lot in common that we would all agree on. And I think it's those common things that I'm looking at when I when I say common sense. Um, your third part about whether incorporating top-down processing slash slash information is a challenge. I do think it's very much a challenge, especially with a lot of these deep networks where much of the processing is feed forward. Um, and there's a lot of interesting work going on in, in other groups that try to do something about getting that contextual information back into the model and having it do sort of a more back and forth in its reasoning so that it's not just all bottom up. So I think there's a lot of open problems there. Okay, one last question. Speaking of common sense, um, oh, I should say, I'm Tom Mitchell from Carnegie Mellon. Um, speaking of common sense, when you're thinking about capturing it in these ways, to what degree do you think that, um, if I take a piece of common sense like uh, shadows are often under trees, I could uh, capture that and represent it as a kind of declarative statement, as I just did, or I could embed it procedurally in some code that I have. For example, a deep network for recognizing trees might implicitly capture that. So my question is really, to what degree, what do you think about this declarative and procedural opportunity? And to what degree are you trying to capture one or another, or right. so what's the right way? Right, so I, I don't know if I have an answer to what the right way is. I do think a lot of the, the example of that when you're trying to recognize a tree, it might already pick up on the fact that shadows are typically under the tree. Um, that actually gets in the way a lot, and we see, we see that especially in visual question answering, where these models end up not being compositional, and so they end up learning heavy correlations from the training set that then don't generalize to the test set. So if you've seen what color is the cone um, very often in the training, and the answer was usually orange, um, and now if you see a green cone at test time, even though you know what green looks like because you can recognize other things that are green, you're going to go ahead and just say orange because that's your safer answer. And I think that's where I, I think it would be better if we had sort of an external representation that had statements that we could use in compositional ways in tandem with sort of picking up correlations from the training data set. And there, ha there have been a few efforts that are trying to do that, but I don't think there's any work out there so far that does it in a convincing way that can take advantage of both, that can take advantage of all the knowledge bases, structured knowledge that we have out there, and use deep nets to put those two together to, for things exactly like visual question answering. Because our intention with visual question answering was never to just use the training set as all the knowledge in the world and just train something on it and test. We always had a sense that there are going to be questions that you've never seen during training that you need to get right. And the only way you can do that is if you leverage some external source of information. But that hasn't happened much at all. And I think, that, and I think that's important and would be very useful, but it's also difficult to do. Thank you. Uh, so let's uh, thank the speaker again. I must admit that if common sense were in my algorithm when you had the bear and Mike and Lisa, Mike would be running from the bear and Lisa would be scaring it away. But it was an excellent talk. <laughs>